Hello and welcome to History Hack. Uh, we have a really exciting episode for you. We're recording this in the evening, so if I refer to evening, that is why. Today we have Dusty Nickel joining us. Dusty is a geologist based in California, so being a geologist, he's written a book about Miss Spain. But it's a very exciting Miss Spain, because the book's entitled Miss Spain in Exile... Issa Reyes, Escape from the Spanish Civil War, Flamenco, Stardom in 1930s Europe. And we're delighted to say that this is about Dusty's mum. So welcome to the show, Dusty. This is going to be a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you, Matt. I've been looking forward to this. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And just to let everyone know, you're in lovely Northern California, which seems a whole lot nicer place to be than us trapped in (laughs) <laughs> trapped in southern England. How's lockdown been for you in California? Uh, well, you know, we live in the country, so it, it hasn't affected us as much as it's affected others. We we live in a very rural part of California. Uh, we miss driving down to San Francisco to go to shows and swim in the bay, which is our hobby, and do things like that. But in the end, it's uh, it's almost sad to admit that the lockdown hasn't affected us all that much. It makes me wonder what kind of life I've been living. Right, so let's 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 get in let's get into this. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, where was your mother born, and what was she doing uh, when Franco invaded Spain? Yeah, my mother was born in 1921 in Barcelona. Um, I'll revert to my Castilian pronunciation when I speak Spanish. But she moved to Madrid at a very early age, and she grew up a very she was always remembered and described, I think, accurately is a very idyllic, carefree childhood. Their family was upper middle class. Her father was a lawyer with a good practice, a very well-educated, both a gentleman and a gentle man. Uh, He was famous for his ability to hear a piece of classical music once and sit down at the piano and play it. Somewhat oddly, for a man of his social standing in Spain, he was somewhat left-leaning, I think driven to a great extent, by the sympathy for humanity. Um, although he had friends who were more right-leaning, and I'll talk about that more a bit later, he was he leaned somewhat to the left. He was a real supporter of the Spanish Republic from the beginning. His friends used to tease him that he was a very special kind of socialist. He was a socialist who believed in socialism as long as he himself could have his suits handmade at Savile Row and he could enjoy the finest wines and cognacs and delicacies. But um, my mother then, of course, grew up with a sympathy for for the left and a loyalty to the Republic. He used to go every summer to the Sierra de Gredos near Avila, northwest of Madrid, for his annual hunting trip. He would always take my mother and her sister, my Aunt Nuria, and one of my mother's childhood friends. My grandmother who was at least viewed herself as a bit more blue-blooded than her husband. To put it diplomatically, she didn't appreciate the charms of the country vacation as much as everyone else in the family did. So she would happily stay behind in Madrid with her books and their art collection. And my father would take the girls up to the mountains for their annual vacation. And that's where they were the day that Franco invaded invaded Spain, the day started the insurrection and his troops invaded. Her childhood came to an end very quickly that summer. Within a couple of days of the insurrection starting, she saw her first dead body. It was a Franco sympathizer who had been caught by a left-leaning mob and murdered and his body tied to a, a mule and left to wander. She saw early, and this is something that affected her her whole life, she saw that the world was not as black and white as some people wanted to believe. Although her father was loyal to the Republic, many of his friends were more right-leaning, and he helped some of them escape the marauding Republican mobs. His best friend was a, a gentleman on whom my mother admitted to having a childhood crush, Don Rafael, whom my father, whom her father helped hide in the basement of the hotel where they were staying so that no one could find him. Um, so, so she learned early that it, it wasn't all black and white. Her idyllic childhood came crashing to a halt uh, 
But even with this, and this was typical of my mother, she always looked back on things and saw the humor in them. And the, the two stories that she would always tell about those days in the mountains before they were able to make their way back to Madrid was one, how she used to love watching her father training the young men who would become part of the militia of the Republic. And she could describe in great deal of the sounds and the smells, the clouds of dust rising from their feet as they learned how to march and hearing one of them say, well, what is this fascism that we're supposed to fight? And her father saying, it's an evil force. It must be stopped. And as she always said, they didn't know what fascism meant, but they knew that men they trusted, men like her father, told them it was something that had to be fought, and so they prepared to fight it. The other story that she always told, though, and she would laugh harder every time she told it, was she and her sister had a favorite swimming hole uh, that they thought was a secret that no one knew about. And one day, just a few days after the Civil War had started, they went up there for their swim, and were very upset to find a group of students from the University of Salamanca were there swimming in their private hole. And they started to leave in a huff when the boys convinced them to stay and join them. And after a while, of course, this being Spain, someone had pulled out a guitar, someone else had pulled out a bota of wine. They were having a lovely time. And then as it began to get dark, the a couple of the boys offered to walk the girls back to the hotel uh, just to be chivalrous gentlemen. Not knowing what to do with their towels, they wrapped them around their heads. And as they walked into the village, all of a sudden, the old women started screaming, Los Moros, Los Moros, the Moors, the Moors. Well, within the dusk, with those white towels, the boys looked like Moors. And there was still, in that part of Spain, a, a, an ancestral memory of being invaded by the Moorish Hordes. Everyone started screaming. Some people pulled out shotguns and switchblades. And it was only when the boys started singing an, a, an old Castilian ballad about El Cid that they realized everything was safe. And they stopped. And the girls told my mother's father about that, thinking it was really funny. And the result, of course, was that they were prohibited from going to the pond ever again. And my father said, or her father, my grandfather said, yeah, this was funny, but it could have been not so funny. So they were there. It took them a few weeks to arrange transport. The, the war was literally raging around them. Uh, they were right on the line between the part of Spain that went immediately to the nationalist side and the part of Spain that stayed on the loyalist side. It took them several weeks to organize transportation back to Madrid and then they went, they went back to Madrid. I, I don't know the precise date, but I'd say it was probably mid-August by then, about a month into the war. Memories run long in Spain, don't they? Just thinking the wars uh, have been gone yeah. for hun hundreds of years by that point, and yet that, that was still, still fresh for those locals. Yeah, and in fact, that fear was well-founded. Franco was, uh, he used every cynical ploy of terror he could think of to win his war, and one of them was to bring in, he brought in Moorish mercenaries from Spain. They fought with their friends from the Spanish Foreign Legion on the nationalist side, and they did, in fact, terrorize much of Republican Spain, in addition to the this, uh, the military effect. It had a, a deep psychological effect on the population. It, it did, in fact, instill all of the terror that Franco wanted it to instill. So eventually they did need to flee, didn't they? Yeah, it was decided that it was too dangerous to stay in Spain. And and again, this is a good example of how blurred the lines were and how great things became. Although my grandfather was serving the Republic, because he lived in a nice house and had a nice collection of books and art, it was just assumed by many people that he must be a right winger. And they got out just in time. It's two days after they left. Their house was broken into, ransacked, everything looted, the books destroyed. But yeah, they decided to leave. They decided that my mother, her sister, and her mother would leave and go to Paris and wait out the war. At that point, they were still optimistic the Republic would win. Well, her, her father stayed behind initially as an officer in the militia of the Republic, 
excuse me, and then eventually taking on a post with the diplomatic corps. So they decided to leave. It took them a while to get their papers organized. The air raids of Madrid had started by then, and they decided it was too dangerous to stay in Madrid and that they needed to find a safe place to stay until their papers came through and they could get to Paris. My mother's uncle, Alfonso, was at the time the commanding officer of the Republican air base at Sarinena, outside Valencia, and actually just outside Zaragoza, on the way to Valencia. And they decided that they would go stay there uh, until their papers came through, which delighted my mother because she loved her un uncle Alfonso. Uh, uncle Alfonso was just a... Uh, the, the phrase bigger than life doesn't quite to begin doesn't quite begin to describe him. The phrase colorful um, doesn't either. He was he was something else, and I'll, I'll confess he was one of my heroes when I was a little boy dreaming of a life of adventure. I would hear stories about Uncle Alfonso, who graduated apparently barely, but he did graduate from the military academy in Toledo, and immediately volunteered for the Spanish Foreign Legion was sent off to Africa, fought in the Africa in the Moroccan Wars, came back with a chest full of medals, which saved him from a longer prison sentence than he would have received otherwise after being implicated in a plot to bomb the King of Spain. Somewhere at that point, and I think it was before the assassination attempt, he was sent, this, this was one of my mother's favorite stories about Uncle Alfonso, he was sent to Washington, D.C. as a military attache in the Spanish embassy. And he really enjoyed Washington. He enjoyed the social life of a military attache. But he decided at some point that the uniform he'd been assigned wasn't appropriate for a man of his stature. And he went to a tailor in Washington and designed a uniform, which I never saw a photo of, but apparently it was some cross between a Louis the Fourteenth courtier and a Habsburg uh, <laughs> chief bureaucrat. It had feathers and epaulets and God knows what else. And he would happily wear this thing to embassies, and no one had the uh, no one knew quite how to tell him he shouldn't. So he did. He eventually became rather close friends with the daughter of the Irish ambassador to the United States. Uh, managed to get her pregnant. A hasty marriage was arranged. Tragically, she was killed in a car accident. Uh, he went back to Spain, learned how to fly, became a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And unlike almost all of the other former officers and officers of the Foreign Legion, he remained loyal to the Republic. So he was commanding the air base at Sarinena. I have a photo of him that I so wish I had found in time to include in the book, but I only found it about a month after the book had gone to press. Picture of Uncle Alfonso with his flying jacket standing in front of one of the Russian surplus biplanes that had been sent to the Republic that he would go up in this biplane and take on the Luftwaffe, mm -hmm. um, thinly disguised as Goering's Condor Legion. Um, another story my mother used to love to tell was after his Irish wife was killed, Uncle Alfonso married a beautiful Spanish girl who was at the base with them. One of the reasons that Uncle Alfonso's men loved him so much was that whenever a new plane arrived, he would insist on being the first pilot to take it up and make sure it was airworthy. And only after that would he let someone else fly it. Well, every time he climbed into the cockpit, his wife would go running into the base chapel with her rosaries, get on her knees wailing and praying um, until it landed again. <laughs> But she had, she had a, a very, probably romanticized memory of staying there, but as with so many things in her young life, tinged with tragedy. A few days before they got word that their papers had come through and they could leave for Paris, the fascist staged an air raid on the camp, killed several of Uncle Alfonso's officers, came very close to killing my mother. Um, and that was her, her final memory of it, was saying goodbye to Uncle Alfonso, wondering if she'd ever see him again. And she always used to tell the story that as they were leaving, Uncle Alfonso's officers stood in a line and saluted my mother 
and her sister, my Aunt Nuria, and presented them with little medals um, and told them to wear them to always remember how brave they had been during the air raids. You know, the, just just thinking of the, I usually look after the the aircraft shows on 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 History Hack, and it was it was an interesting mix of aircraft that the uh, that the Republicans flew. So, you know, that that would have been that would have been quite quite something for your your great uncle to be probably jumping in and out of lots of different things. It was fascinating. Um, but we're in Paris now. So, what was family life like in Paris for? For essentially these refugees from the civil, from the civil war well they they were lucky that my grandmother's sister her aunt uh, her sister and grandma lived in Paris with her daughters and my mother's cousins, so they had a place to stay. Uh, that family didn't have a great deal of money they were living on what savings they could they were staying in the apartment of a friend um, my mother and her mother and sister got out literally with what they could carry in their suitcases. And by the time uh, the last piece of jewelry had been sold, they had to find a way to make a living. Her mother took on some sewing work um, that she would do in the evenings. And my mother's cousins had been doing some modeling for fashion shops in Paris, for the couturier, and they were able to get my mother a job, and that was the beginning of her artistic career. She started doing a little bit of modeling, but they were very poor at, at the beginning. She always used to tell the story that they would conserve every franc to make sure they could make it through the week and pay the rent. But once a week, she, her mother, and her sister could go to the cafe on the corner, and they could buy one lemonade, and they could sit on the sidewalk for the sidewalk table for as long as they wanted and share a lemonade. Then if it had been a good week, they could also buy one piece of cake to share with their lemonade. And she always, she always used that memory as a metaphor for how poor mm -hmm. they had been. Um, but the, the modeling led to, um, she was seen by the movie producer, uh, Guitry, who was quite well known and just, his career was taking off in Paris at that time. And she ended up through that getting a part as an extra in a movie. She used to tell a very funny story that all she had to do for that scene was lead, wear a gypsy costume and lead a horse three paces from where the horse was standing next to another gypsy to a well. All the rehearsals went well. Everything was fine until came the day of the shoot when the horse decided he didn't feel like drinking water. <laughs> and they had, to, they had to rewrite the whole scene to accommodate the stubborn horse. And my mother was always convinced that the, ho that the horse had a glint of humor in his eye as he pulled this off. Then she got offered another. She was very pretty and and had, had a great deal of personality even at that young age. She was offered another part in a movie but came down with the measles. And in the time it took her to recover, someone else got the part. So she always said that was her, her first attempt at a movie career came grinding to a halt over an illness. But she then got a job as an artist model. And she posed for several well-known artists in Paris, most not notably for the poster uh, artist, Jean-Gabriel Domergue, who did a lot of the, you would recognize a lot of his posters, even if you didn't know they were his. I, I still see them around the world when I travel. They were a lot of them done for vacation destinations or, or various things. She did one that became fairly well known, um, advertising Monte Carlo. He did several labels for various wines and perfumes. So she spent several, uh, several months working for various artists and developed during that time the, the, the love of art that, that stayed with her for the rest of her life. That, that, that's what, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the posters. I'm going to do some Googling of the posters afterwards. Cause, uh, yeah, and I can, I, can, I, can, I can send you one too. Again, there was one, two great ones that I wish I'd found in time for the book. Um, and there's a story I'll tell you a little bit later that I don't know why it slipped my mind. I didn't include it in the book. I wish I had, but it, you know, it falls in the category of finding the egregious proofing error five minutes after <laughs> it's 
fix it. I, I thought of a, a couple of things too late, but that's that's what happens when a geologist tries to write a history book. It doesn't come out with everything that that perhaps it should have included. I, I'm sure that's not a trait just to geologists writing books. Alex would undoubtedly have the same stories for that one. Um, right, so where we are, we're, so we're in Paris. She's starting to get noticed, and then she's her big break happens. What what was that, and what was she up to when she's... Yeah, at this discovered? point, and it's important to remember, she's 16 years old. She She's a girl. She's... She tries to look grown up by smoking cigarettes, um, which make her cough. Um, she still thinks boys are annoying, and she doesn't really understand why they have to take up so much of everyone's time. She's working as a model for artists, but her love, all of her life, what she has wanted to do is be a dancer. And she used to dream as a little girl that someday she would be a famous dancer. She loved any kind of dancing, but particularly flamenco dancing. She loved playing castanets. And the one of the cousins sharing um, the apartment with them, her, her real name was Toyin, but her stage name was Alma, and I refer to her throughout the book as Alma. Alma was also a dancer, and the two of them started just in the evenings to have fun dancing. And one day, their aunt... Uh, well, uh, Alma's mother and my mother's aunt and Karna said, you know, the two of you really are pretty good. If you practice and put a show together, I'll introduce you to my friend, the Duchess, who organizes a Paris charity ball every year. And maybe we can talk her into using you. And so they did. They practiced. My mother's sister, Aunt Nuri, who who was already and became even more a very accomplished guitar player. She studied under Carlos Montoya several times. Um, she would play guitar, and my mother and Alma would dance. Eventually, they moved on to taking some lessons and hiring a choreographer to help them and had a piano as, as accompaniment. Um, but they ended up going and auditioning first privately and informally for for the Duchess, who said something like, they're not too bad, I'll give them a try if they promise not to embarrass me. And the evening of the charity ball, they were allowed to perform. They were a great hit. And in fact, they were such a hit that they were asked to do a couple of encores. Um, despite the fact, and this is typical of so many things when my mother remembered them and told the story, she'd remember the funny parts and the ridiculous parts. She would focus on how it all went well, despite the fact that their piano player, who was a somewhat elderly French woman, had stopped drinking quite some time earlier, but couldn't resist the endless glasses of champagne that were presented to her. As, the, as this went on, she would apparently started playing faster and faster, and my mother and Alma had to dance faster and faster, but somehow they pulled it off and were noticed at this. And the way Paris was in those days, uh, I suppose had been for a while, all of the newspaper society writers were at this event, and they noticed the act, and word got out, and they started getting offers to perform in nightclubs. And then it just, it took off, like, like as my mother always said, like a fairy tale. Uh, the next thing they knew, they were dancing at the Lido in Paris. They were dancing uh, at the nightclub where Maurice Chevalier was the leading performer. Sometimes with Aunt Nuri playing the guitar, sometimes not. Um, but they just started becoming more and more no, one of the fun things that came out of this for me personally was years later, the nightclub where they performed quite frequently was just off Champs Elysees. It was called Le, Le Bouffe sur le Toit, which was a somewhat avant garde nightclub in the 30s. They were known for their jazz acts. My mother and Alma were a recurring act there. But by the 70s and 80s, the Bustle Le Toit had become a, a restaurant, a quite nice restaurant, where I went once with Alma when I had gone to Paris on business and I went to see her. We went to dinner there. There's still a life-size poster of my mother and Alma at the entrance. 
and I became friends with the manager. And then, then for years, if I was in Paris doing business and maybe things weren't going well and I wanted to be treated like a gentleman, I could go to Le Bousseur Le Trois and everyone would recognize me and give me a glass of champagne and, and I could, I could feel like a big shot and have fun. But anyway, they, um, they I took off. They, they quickly became more and more known in, uh, in Paris. And eventually that led to the offers I write about in the book to, to travel first around France and then around Europe in the years before the war for Foreman. There, there were some vodka fueled parties as well, I hear. Yeah, that, that, that seemed to catch uh, everyone's imagination and somewhat to my surprise. Yeah, what happened? They, uh, they danced first. They, they had a summer in the French Riviera in Monte Carlo and Nice. And then several months in Poland, which my mother really enjoyed. She danced in Warsaw and Krakow. Uh, then when they came back from Poland, they had to leave the apartment in which they'd been living. They couldn't find a place to stay. And as time was running out and they were becoming desperate what they were going to do, a friend of theirs told them about a suite of rooms that had become available in a hotel in what had become the white Russian emigre neighborhood of Paris. So they, they moved into these rooms on the top floor. Uh, they shared it with like, a couple of dozen Russian families, an elderly French manager and a French cook who could only cook if he had a bottle of Burgundy open uh, next to him. But one of the, my mother said, the Russians, whom she grew to really love, she became friends with them. They shared a love of music and a love of dancing. They, most of them had gotten jobs in Paris as hotel bellmen or taxi drivers. And I should say that, that 28 to 30 days a month, depending on the month of the year, they were cultured intelligentsia who loved to recite poetry and trade stories about history with her. But one night a month, they would invite all their friends over and start opening bottles of vodka and next thing they knew, empty bottles would be flying down the staircase, furniture would be being broken in the dancing. They would insist on trying to teach my mother how to do the Cossack dances. And, uh, and it was great fun for her. It was something she remembered. She always had a soft spot in her heart for that memory. It was also during, uh, while they were living there, it was one of my mother's favorite stories. Um, when they were rehearsing, they, they had come up with some new dance steps that they wanted to practice. They were practicing by the window and then eventually going out on the balcony. And my mother started doing this. She was just always trying to be funny and always trying to make people laugh. And she started doing these exaggerated wailings of a, of a gypsy for the flamenco and then said that she was now going to, to do the dance of the death of the gypsy woman and sort of did this really dramatic, you know, wiping her forehead and her arms flailing and her knees buckling while she tapped with her feet and played the castanets. Uh, as all matured her on and as her sister Nuria played the guitar. And then when she stopped, they heard all of this applause and shouts of brava, brava. And one ole that she always felt was the one lonesome Spaniard in the crowd from the, the, the people on the sidewalk. They had just been walking by and seen this crazy girl imitating the dramatic death of a gypsy and stopped to watch and got into the show. And they demanded she do an encore, which she obligingly did for them. And then bowed, shut the curtain and burst into, and burst into laughter. She, she got to travel Europe pre-war in a very interesting time but she bumped into some interesting characters along the way she brushed shoulders with Hitler didn't she yeah that was something um, it's actually one of the few parts of the book that was difficult for me to write in, in that I was trying to to really capture what she went through she, she had toured Europe with Alma and they got they they became part of a dance trio with uh, with a, with a well known male dancer. He got them to sign a contract, and part of it was was to tour in Europe. And she just she was excited to have the opportunity to tour, and she agreed to be 
part of the trio and represented by the agent they had. And then they told her, this would have been in 1939, that they were going to Berlin to perform. And that one of the reasons they were going to Berlin at that time was that they were going to perform for Hitler's 50th birthday party. And she was aghast and didn't want to go. She burst into tears. Um, and it led to a conversation that must have been excruciating for her along the lines of a contract is a contract and you have to do this. So she went and she could describe for the rest of her life in great detail what it felt like to be behind the stage at the Wintergarten Theater in Berlin and hear the stomping of boots coming in and hear the, the rabid Heil Hitlers of the crowd as they got worked up when their, their Fuhrer came in. And then coming out on stage and looking down and seeing what, for the rest of her life, she described as the gallery of 20th century evil sitting in front of her. But she she sucked it up, as they say, and put on her show, and and that was it. Um, so it was it, it was against her will, but she did it, and she was she was a part of history. She was then later, um, you know, it was actually before that, just before that, uh, she had another run in with the fascists. She had been, uh, she and Alma went to Venice for two weeks to perform at the casino in Venice. And the first night that she was dancing, she she had a, um, as part of her act, as the first act ended, was she'd throw a flower out into the audience. And she had the bad luck that the flower landed on the plate, on the dinner plate of Count Chano, Mussolini's son-in-law and, and foreign minister. Chano was a notorious womanizer and ladies' man. He thought that she was flirting with him. And then uh, basically she couldn't get rid of him. He started following her around and showing up at her hotel until uh, she used a, a somewhat imaginative ploy to get rid of him, which I, will, I won't tell the story here in case anyone listening to this decides to, to read the book. But uh, she always laughed later about how, how she managed to get rid of him. I, I think that's re- reason enough to pick up the book. She, I, I, I feel so so much for she, she escapes fascism and then is confronted with it just about everywhere else she goes. That must have been so heartbreaking for her. Yeah, it was. And particularly, it, it, it was not just confronting fascism. It was, even at that young age, she understood enough to know that that the Western democracies had turned their back on the Spanish Republic, but it was Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy that were providing the arms and material for the fascists, for the, for the army that was trying to kill her father and her uncle Alfonso and many of her friends. And one of the things that really bothered her about the, about the Berlin performance was that the Civil War had ended by then, the fascists had won. And so there was a certain symbolism of a Spanish dancer appearing on the stage in Berlin. It it was an implication of of solidarity between Spain and Germany, which of course was the last thing my mother wanted to be to be part of. Despite that though, Venice was she loved Venice. It, It had a place in her heart for the rest of her life. I talk about in the book how years afterward she and my father would go to Venice and they would always go to the casino where she'd performed and they'd gamble a little bit and she'd, she'd relive some of her childhood. So while she was doing this, she was also doing some modeling, wasn't she? Um, I've got a note here that she could almost claim to be a Bond girl. I need to know about that, Dusty. Yeah, that, that's a funny story. She, uh, she did continue the modeling. I guess it was a way to bring money in from time to time. One of the posters that that Jean Gabriel Domer did. It was a poster for Monte Carlo. And it's a the uh the Pond connection was years later, I, I think it was 1983 or 1984. My mother was living in Washington DC by then. I'd gone to visit her and she loved anything with Sean Connery in it. She wanted to go see and and the new 
James Bond. It was the last movie Connery did as Bond was Never Say Never Again. And we went to see it, and it's actually a pretty good movie anyway. But there is a scene where Sean Connery puts a uh, puts a bad guy in a closet and spends a few seconds talking to him and putting what is actually a cigarette lighter, but he tells the guy it's a bomb, and if you move, it'll blow you up. But during, during the seven or eight seconds that they're face-to-face talking to each other, the background of the set in that closet is the poster that my mother posed for. And so we were watching. We had no idea this would be on. We're watching a movie, uh, the you know, crowd of Washington, D.C. moviegoers who, unlike Spanish moviegoers, tend to be very quiet and respectful during a movie. And all of a sudden, my mother yelped in Spanish, so yo, so yo, it's me. I said, what? And I looked back <laughs> from my my popcorn and there was my mom, and then of course it was gone. Um, so we we had to sit through the movie again to uh, to make sure it really had been her, but it was. And I have it's one of my favorite things I have. My nephew um, made me a print of the scene from that movie. You can see Sean Connery and the other guy, and behind them the poster of my mother. So that's I suppose my mother was a Bond girl, one step removed. I I, I know. Damien Lewis of Band of Brothers fame always claims that his wife, Helen McCrory, is a Bond girl, even though she's in it as one of the baddies grilling Q. So I guess that makes your mother a Bond girl as well, if, if uh, that's Damien that's Lewis's logic. You can take it, happily. So what about wine in Africa? Because we were t- chatting about wine earlier, and I think let's, yeah, uh, let's bring that in. Just another example of um, things coming up when I would least expect them. During one of my uh, one of my geology trips to West Africa, I was working in, in Equatorial Guinea. I was in, in the hinterland. To, to say I was in the back of beyond doesn't quite cover how remote the area was. And I'd gone, I'd spent the day mapping geology and doing my work. And on the way back to my camp, I saw a little roadside bar and it looked relatively safe. So I went in to have a beer. And so I was sitting there, I saw an old bottle of Dubonnet on the shelf behind the bar, uh, covered with dust. And I asked the barman if I could see it. And sure enough, the label was a poster of my mother. And I remembered she had told us that one of the Lomeric posters became, uh, became a Dubonnet label for a short period of time. So I, I convinced the barman to sell me the bottle, and I thought this would be really cool. But unfortunately, it was Equatorial Guinea, and there were checkpoints and soldiers, and there was no way an undrunk bottle of alcohol was going to make it past uh, one of those checkpoints. So it was uh, it was gone. And as someone pointed out to me, I should have just drunk it and kept the bottle. So it didn't occur to me. Plus, the bottle was so old, I was a little bit afraid of it. But it was, it was fun. And of course, in retrospect, I wish I'd thought of another way to keep it or taken a photograph of it. But, but it's a fun memory for me. That's a wonderful memory. So let's get to the big one. She becomes Miss Spain. So for a woman who's essentially in exile, that, that, must, have been, that must have been huge. Yeah, it was 1938. The French newspapers decided that they should put on a Miss Spain column. There were enough Spanish girls and young women living in Paris at the time that they decided to put on the competition so that there, so that Spain would have a contestant for the upcoming Miss Europe competition. And much to my mother's surprise, she was uh, coming home from a modeling job one day. She got out of the subway. Her sister was waiting for her, waving an envelope, saying, look, look, they want you to be Miss Spain. I said, what are you talking about? Um, it was an invitation to appear at a newspaper office for an interview. So she went with with her mother and went to the interview. She thought it hadn't gone well. And she always told the story that walking out, she told her mother she was sorry. She didn't think it had gone well, but it was all really stupid anyway. Who wants to be Miss Spain? That's a stupid title. Of course, a week later, she got the news that she'd been crowned Miss Spain and she decided it wasn't that stupid after all. <laughs> and she liked it 
And as a result, I was invited to go to the Miss Europe competition in Copenhagen, where in the end she came in second, losing out to Miss Finland. Uh, she made very good friends with some of the other girls. She always said particularly Miss Russia became a very good friend of hers. But there is a, to me, I thought of the very touching story that came out of that. Uh, every time the girls would appear on stage, they'd wear a, a banner with the flag of their country. And this created a problem for my mother. The Civil War was still going on. They wouldn't let her wear the purple, yellow, red flag of the Spanish Republic because that would be viewed as controversial. But she refused to wear the yellow and red flag of fascist Spain. So in the end, the compromise was she got a white banner and printed with some kind of crayon, she printed the word España on it and appeared wearing that. And there's a lovely photo I have of all the other girls with their flags and my mother looking a little bit forlorn um, with her little, that looks like a bed sheet with the word España written on it. But the crowd understood the gesture and she got a standing ovation. And she always, she had already loved Denmark and the Danes. That, that solidified for her a, a love and respect for, for Danes. She felt that as soon as they saw her, they understood what that meant and, and showed their appreciation. That's that's wonderful. And now they all wear sashes with their countries on them. Yeah. He says not being a fan of, of <laughs> a, a, a regular watcher of the competition. I think I think I've saved myself there, Dusty. No one will ever know. Um, these sound like really glamorous years for her, but they must have taken a toll because they would have been incredibly stressful as well. Yeah, they did. And, and you know, the important thing. I said this before, but it, it, it's important to remember if, if you read my story, if you read my mother's story, she was young. She was a girl. She was growing up. She grew up very quickly, but she was still a girl. And she didn't... One of the things I tried to capture in the book, I hope I succeeded, was the, the simultaneous living her dream. She had dreamed since childhood of being a dancer and being famous. She was doing that. She was performing. She was going to the top venues in Europe. Um, but she was watching the world approach. She was watching the world go up in flames. She had found out what death was. She had been bombed. And yet somehow she managed to hold on to her dream and she managed to live it. It affected her for the rest of her life in a number of ways. She, she hated fascism. She hated the word fascism. She hated the concept fascism. She hated bullies. She hated anything that reminded her of the strong and privileged preying on the weak and dispossessed would make her blood boil. Her view of history, 20th century history, was very much shaped by her watching the Western democracies betray Spain and as she always said, and, and I agree with her completely, World War II was shamelessly rehearsed on Spanish soil with Spanish blood and Spanish tears. Um, she never got over it. She couldn't. Our favorite movie was the classic movie Casablanca. She loved the movie, but she would always burst into tears. There's a wonderful scene where the Nazis are singing their Wacht am Rhein and the Czechoslovakian gets the band to play the Marseillaise and they drown them out, she, she'd burst into tears. Uh, and then she'd say, I hate fascism. I hate the fascists. And she had some, some psychological scars. Um, the, the air raids in Madrid that had her hiding in the basement made her for the rest of her life. She had a horrible claustrophobia and a terrible fear of loud noises, any firecrackers, fireworks, anything like that. She couldn't say, she would just start shaking. Um, there's a story I tell in the book. It was one of her favorite stories. They had been in Poland for several months. And while they were there performing, their, their papers expired. And they had to transit Germany to get back to France. And they didn't know what to do. And finally, the last night in Warsaw, my mother's mother took an eyeliner pencil 
and very carefully and meticulously forged you know, expiration dates on their papers. And going into Germany, they knew their papers wouldn't be checked in great detail because they were only transiting, but they'd be checked leaving. And so we're transiting Germany. My mother's mother kept telling the girls, remember when the Gestapo come to check the papers, flirt with them and try to distract them. So they got to the border and some very hard-eyed men wearing black leather coats went into the compartment and said, you know, I, I suppose they said, uh, Ausweis, bitte. And they handed their, their papers. And then my mother started batting her eyelids. Um, her, her cousin, Doyin, who was just funny as hell, started babbling at them in what she thought was German worthy of Goethe, but no one could understand a word she was saying through her, her French accent. And then little, and little Nuria started shoving boxes of chocolates under their noses to distract them. So after all this, they didn't know what was going on. Meanwhile, my grandmother sat very nonchalantly with her nose in a book, trying to appear bored by the whole thing. And finally, they accepted the papers, gave them whatever stamp they needed, and left. And everyone sighed with relief. And my mother, she would always laugh telling that story. And you know, being my mother, she'd make it really funny. And she'd talk about the senorita antics. But it really shook her. And I found out years later how much it shook her. It's 70, it must have been the Christmas of 73. My parents were living in Spain. And I was going to university in Boston. I managed to fly home for Christmas. And they had moved since the last time I'd been there. So I, I flew into Malaga. I took a bus to the town where they were and then walked to their house. It was a cold, foggy evening, as can be in winter in Spain, December in Spain. And I was wearing a knee-length black leather coat that a friend had given me that I was actually very proud of at the time. And I got to the house that uh, that I thought they lived in, knocked on the door, my mother opened the door, and for two or three seconds, she didn't realize it was me. She just saw a big man wearing a black leather coat standing in the fog, backlit by a street lamp, and she started shaking. And just shaking and shaking, it just evoked the memory of every scary Gestapo man she'd seen in Germany. And then when she realized it was me, of course, she got over it, but it was... Um, and, and she admitted later she was surprised at the reaction it created, and I ended up giving the coat away. I just couldn't, I couldn't wear it after that. And other, um, maybe it came similarly when the last time she was in Germany was after the Berlin performance, the performances. And they were leaving. Uh, their papers were in order this time, so they were fine. But as the train stopped at the French border, the Gestapo came on board and they removed a few people from the train that looked horrified. And the last time my mother saw them, they were being led off into a shed um, by guards with German shepherd dogs on leashes. And I remember, and I, was, I must have been five or six years old, and I have no idea why, but I decided I wanted a German shepherd dog. And my mother and I went to a kennel near San Francisco to look at them, and my mother saw the yeah, very nice dogs, but German shepherds on leashes being trained to be obedient, and she just, she couldn't do it. Uh, I go back, I think they bought me a Dalmatian. What was funny, though, was Aunt Nuria, my Aunt Nuria, had stayed in Paris. She hadn't been in Germany, so she didn't have this fear of German shepherds. In fact, she ended up living in Mexico City, raising several German shepherds, which... Um, having her own bizarre sense of humor, she always named after obscure Asturian poets. So there's <laughs> always a German shepherd with a name like Baldomero um, running around. But anyway, by, by these things, my mother always portrayed a carefree view of the world, but there were there were inevitable scars from the things that she witnessed as a very young girl. I can totally imagine that. But we have some brightness in this because just on the eve of war she meets your father how did that happen yeah it's now it's june of 1939 we're, we're three months away from the invasion of poland 
and the formal start of World War II. She and her partner now, by now Alma had decided to go back to Spain, but she and her dance partner got an invitation to spend the summer in Athens. They got on a boat, went to Athens, and of course took my mother's mother and her sister with them. And on the way there, her partner Antonio prophetically said, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to lose you here. You're going to meet a handsome Greek man and I'll lose you and I'll have to find a new partner. And sure enough, they got to Athens and the first night at the nightclub, she was performing and sat at a table near the stage was a tall, handsome man wearing a white suit who kept staring at her. At the intermission, she went back into her dressing room and she couldn't get in for all of the flowers that had been sent to her, apparently by this white-suited gentleman sitting in the audience. And her first reaction was, oh, no, it's going to be a repeat of the Count Chano episode. But, of course, it was my father. They fell in love. Within weeks, they had decided uh, to marry each other. And then they, um, they found out then that my mother's father had ended up in Cuba, where he'd become the... Uh, and I'll age myself when I say he'd become the Walter Cronkite of Cuba. He'd become the voice of, of news on Radio Havana because he had a very deep, mellifluous Castilian voice. It made him sound formal and proper to a Cuban ear. Um, he said, I'm in Cuba. I'm well established now. Come join me here. So they decided to to go to to Cuba. My My mother and... Her sister and mother left first. My father, who was in his own way, he was as remarkable a person as my mother was. He was 18 years older than her. He had been born in a Greek village so small it appears on very few maps. Through sheer intelligence and force of will, he became a, an educated gentleman. He made it to the United States in the 1920s, was deported his second year of university when it, they, he didn't have the proper papers and America was going through one of its periodic stages of xenophobia. He was sent back to, he was put on a play on a train to France, on a, on a train. He was put on a boat to France, made his way to Paris without a penny in his pocket, got a job at a hotel, and it turned out to be the hotel where the writer Nikos Kazantzakis was living. And Kazantzakis befriended my father and helped him pay for his education and would feed him in exchange for my father listening to drafts of Zorba as it was being written. <laughs> Eventually made it back to Greece, went into business, um, made and lost several fortunes in his life. As my brother and I always point out, he lost. We wish he'd made one more fortune, but... Uh, <laughs> But he lived, my mother described him as in, uh, were the words he used. He was a, uh, an adventurer and a bit of a gambler. He, he was all of that. They were madly in love with each other. He was able to follow her to Cuba. Um, his eldest son, I'll, I'll just digress for just for a moment. His eldest son from his first marriage stayed behind. He was another interesting man. He, my brother Lonnie, who joined the Greek resistance, was a hero of the Greek resistance, was eventually captured by the Gestapo, sentenced to die of starvation, and rescued by, by the British Army just in time, taken to England, and more or less adopted by the British Army, who helped him finish his education. Uh, he ended up getting his degree at King's College, Cambridge, and emigrating to Canada, where he was a professor at McGill, Unfortunately, dying very young, he never really recovered from what they did to him. But my uh, father finally followed my mother to Cuba. In the meantime, she had had a, she had been the star at the Hotel Nacional in Cuba with her dance act, uh, was discovered for the second time in her life by MGM, which arranged for her to tour United States before my father made it to join her. She managed to perform in New York City at, at Radio City and in some other venues in the United States and had a movie contract with, with MGM 
which she decided to break. When my father came, they decided that she she decided she didn't want to be a movie star. She wanted to be my father's wife. A decision that Cho said she never regretted. From Cuba, they went. Uh, actually, I'll tell you the, uh, I'll tell you a story. Another story that I loved when I was a child because it summarized to me what their lives, how unsure their lives were. When my father got to Cuba, he became very good friends with my mother's father. They were roughly the same age. They were both gentlemen. They, they got to be friends, but they started trying to decide what to do next. My mother's father wanted to go to Mexico because the Spanish Republic government in exile was in Mexico, and he wanted to go be part of it. My father wanted to go to Brazil because he felt that a man like him could carve a fortune out of the Amazon. And every night after their, their evening game of chess, they would discuss where to go and they couldn't decide. And finally, one night they said, we have to make a decision. We can't stay here. They split a bottle of scotch between them and flipped the coin. And it came up, heads or tails, whatever came up, it was Mexico. And they went to Mexico. About the time they got to Mexico, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the United States entered the war. My father offered his services to the American government, helping procure raw materials for the war effort. And as a result, he was invited to become an American citizen at the end of the war, which he was very proud of, given that he'd been deported um, about 20 years earlier. He was always proud of the fact that he became American by invitation, they settled in the San Francisco area, which is where I was born. And as you say, it had a, a happy end. My mother had a lot of, there were tragedies in her life, but in the end, she, she did get to live her dream. The passion for, for your mother's story is, is so clear to, to see. And thank you so much for sharing it with us, Dusty. But your, your book's based on, on your mother's memoirs. What, what made her start writing those besides this fascinating life? What, what made her put pen to paper? When my mother, when my father died in 1979, my mother was, of course, she was hard. She was devastated. And just to pass the time and ease the suffering, she spent about a year typing her memoirs. And she wrote that they were charmingly written. They're full of, of Spanishism. She spoke a very, she spoke English as well as she spoke French and Italian. Um, but they were full of Spanishisms. And she wanted to get them published and have her story told, but she wasn't able to interest anyone in them. She left the manuscript with us. And I promised her that I would, I would do what I could to one day get it published. And last year, it's worked out for a number of reasons before the COVID pandemic hit that I wanted to take a little time off from exploration geology. And I thought it would be a good time to, to write her book. And of course the uh, pandemic hit and it became a, a necessity more than a choice, which was a perfect opportunity for me to take the time to polish her memoirs and resolve. There was some, she wrote them from memory during during a sad time in her life. So there were some things that I had to reconcile. Some of the timelines she had written didn't quite make sense. Um, some things went back and forth. 90% of what I ascribe to her memory is accurate. The other 10% is at least plausible. At least it makes sense given what I know of history and what people have told me about what was going on. Um, but then I learned, as I guess a lot of uh, aspiring writers learn, it's one thing to write a book, and that's not an easy task. It's a much harder task to have it published. Uh, it, it's a very difficult wor world to break into, I learned. Uh, I had many people that wouldn't even return my call. One person that got quite interested in the book but wanted me to take out the history sections. Um, and I just didn't want to. I really, to me, the whole point of the story was was my mother's life against the background. And, you know, a lot of people, it's not a matter of education. It's just a matter of what, of, of context. A lot of people these days don't really know the story of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, 
of what happened. And I felt that without my telling the story, some of the things wouldn't make sense. So I didn't want to do that. Well, someone else looked at it and implied that if I added some adult uh, scenes, it would sell better. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what I said, but it was something along the lines of, for God's sake, this is my mother I'm writing about. There's not enough therapy in the world to, for me to do what you're suggesting. And then on a whim, I wrote to a historian, Paul Preston of the London School of Economics, who's written some of the the most authoritative books on the Spanish Civil War and introduced myself and asked if I could impose on him to have a look at my manuscript. And to my great good fortune, he took an interest in it and he arranged to have it published through uh, Sussex Academic Press and and, uh, arranged for it to be part of the Cañada Blanche series on Spanish history that London School of Economics uh, sponsors. So it's really thanks to him that my mother's story got to be told. And, and it's really fun for me. It closes a real circle in my life. The last Christmas that I spent with my mother was 1989. And as a gift, I gave her the book that had just been published by a then quite young historian, Paul Preston, entitled The Spanish Civil War. And I always remember she opened the book and the first thing she saw was his dedication to the men and the women of the international brigades who fought and died fighting fascism in Spain. And my mother got really emotional reading and she loved the book. Uh, my brother still has that book with, with my inscription to her in it. And it's a nice circle for me that all these years later now, of course, he is Paul Preston, MBE, a distinguished author and historian. And he took an interest in my book and graciously wrote the preface and, and arranged to have it published. So it's, it's a nice way to end it, and it, it's something that I think would have made my mother very happy. I think we should give the final word to your mother. What, what did she say when people asked her how she always kept a smile on her face? Yeah, I always remember, and this says a lot about my mom. A friend of mine once asked her how she could always be so optimistic and in such a good mood, whatever was going on. And my mom said... You have to remember, by the time I turned 19, I had been in a civil war, a world war. I had been in exile. I'd been a celebrity. I'd lost everything. I'd found the man I would love the rest of my life. And I'd started my life again on a new continent. After that, there was a little life could throw at me that would upset me. Absolutely wonderful and incredible advice for all of us. Dusty, thank you so much for sharing your mother's story with us. What is the name of the book? One more time. Uh, The book is entitled Miss Spain in Exile. In the UK, it's available at Waterstones and through Amazon. Miss Spain in Exile. It just came out about a month ago. Thank you so much for joining us, Dusty. That has been absolutely wonderful. Join us tomorrow when we'll be talking to Carolyn Purnell all about a history of colours and this is so interesting, it's not just what colours mean to different people but it's what colour means in itself to people and how people have responded to it through time and what it's meant to them and how it's appeared to them as well. It's a really interesting chat so don't miss out on that one. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book The 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history. Or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... 
There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year.